A couple of days ago, I did a video regarding blessing food and why that's not correct, why it's not biblically accurate. There's no biblical precedent for that in the way that we've been doing it. And we're just simply told to give thanks. And I got some feedback on that because I realized that, you know, when we're doing studies in scripture, one of the things that I tell you is don't rely on strongs, but read how God used a particular term or concept in a sentence because strongs is man-made. It can be a tool, but you're not to use that tool in the same way that you would be using God's word or spirit. A man-made tool is not gospel. You need to use discernment and question that. Now, when we're reading what God has used in a sentence, a concept or a term that he's used in a sentence, we're getting a sense of God's heart, what he meant, what he loves, what he expects, and what he's teaching us. And likewise, when you've been listening to the world your whole life, even in counterfeit Christianity, even when you thought that it was Christianity that you were listening to, you and I have been ingesting what the world loves, what the world wants, what the world is teaching, even to the extent that they would take Christian terms and concepts and turn them into something that they are not that God never intended for us to believe about that concept that he established. One such concept is a church or the church. I hear people referring to Catholicism as the church. Do you know what a massive problem that is? Referring to the Antichrist, Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes as the church? or counterfeit Christianity, the system that she started as the church, that is a problem. God doesn't refer to counterfeit Christianity as the church. He says that the church, that believers must worship him in the truth and in the spirit, in the truth and in the spirit. Neither of those are happening in counterfeit Christianity and certainly not in Catholicism. So that when I'm talking about the church and people start out on this channel, they ask questions like, well, which church are you talking about? No one was asking Christ that. Do you, do you realize that? That no one was asking Christ or the apostles, which church are you talking about when you say the church? Which gospel are you talking about? Are you talking about Calvin, Luther, David Jeremiah, John MacArthur, which Bible do you use? What study do you use? These things are of the devil. We do not follow after prostitutes. We follow the church as established by Christ. No popes, no fathers, no man's doctrines, none of that. We follow the gospel that is written in the word of God. That's the truth as taught by the Holy Spirit, the church is defined as those who worship God in the truth and in the spirit, which means that there are people in this world who don't have religious freedom to even assemble. Does that mean that they're not part of the church because they don't have the freedom to assemble? They're worshiping God in the truth and in the spirit. They are part of the church. They are more part of the church than people who are assembling every counterfeit Sabbath on Sunday with hundreds of other so-called believers, fake Christians in a cathedral or a stadium seating or a harvest festival or whatever it is that people have been calling Christianity. The church worships God in the truth and the spirit and the word tells us there are a few of them. There are not a lot. So it is probably unlikely that you're even going to be able to find people who you can physically assemble with in your local area. How many people did Abraham have? How many people did Lot have? And if these days are as in the days of Noah, then we know that this is a time of increasing wickedness. How many people do you think you're going to find in the whole world, let alone your local area? When Christ is rebuking the five out of seven lampstands or churches in Revelation 2 and 3, what the word says is to the church in Laodicea, to the church in Ephesus, to the church in whatever respective area, the church. What these are are assemblies of the same church 
in these different locations. He's not talking about denominations. He's not talking about prostitutes. He is talking about assemblies of one church. And in those assemblies, there are some people who are, whose deeds are not finished in the sight of his God. Of those assemblies, there are some who he describes as being lukewarm, and he warns them that they're going to lose their lampstand. Okay, so this is an example of language, of a concept that has been distorted by the way that people are using it in a sentence. And there is a piece of Babylon that God is pulling out of me. And that is the way that we have been using the concept that God established of blessing or what it means for him to bless. So let's t- take a look at Strong's first, which is really, frankly, going to tell us absolutely nothing. But the first concept is bless. The word is a rock. To bless, kneel. To bless oneself. To bless, to be blessed, be adored. To cause, to kneel. To bless oneself. To praise, salute, curse. Not sure why that would be in there. Curse is the opposite of bless, but okay. Do you see why this was totally useless? Most of their definition is to bless for the word to bless. That tells us nothing. But out of the other things that they said, kneel, adore, cause to kneel, praise, salute. You see also why this is worthless is because oftentimes bless is being used as a way in which someone was giving thanks, such as when Jesus fed the 4,000 and he blessed, he gave thanks to God, praised God, and then fed the people. Let's go to the word blessing in Strong's, which is barakah. Fantastic. We see the same thing. Blessing, source of blessing, blessing, prosperity, blessing, praise of God, a gift, present, treaty of peace. Do you see anything about cleaning up food? Do you see anything about like uh, someone asked me about, well, what about the chemicals that are in our food now? And I'm assuming that, that what they meant was how do we get like how do we get rid of the t- chemicals that are in our food? Well, it's not addressed in the Bible. We don't just go and like add our own thing to the scroll because now we have a different situation. If we have a new situation that is presented, then we need to pray and ask God, what do we do about this situation? And he will lead us according to his word, not us leading ourselves according to our own understanding of his word. There are a couple of concepts here within blessing and defining a word with the word, which never ever makes sense to me, but prosperity, praise of God, a gift, a present, a treaty of peace. So we don't have much here, but the way that we can understand what God means about blessing is to go to passages like Leviticus 26, for example. So let's go there and see how God used it in a sentence. Now, what is God going to tell us in Leviticus 26? He's just gotten done telling us that we must observe a Sabbath year and that we will be blessed, that we will be rewarded. Wonder why Strong's didn't use reward in their definition. Doesn't really make sense, does it? Like they could have replaced one of those 10 mentions of blessing with reward, maybe. Leviticus 26 says, do not make for yourself, do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves and do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord, your God. By the way, crystals, anybody using crystals, maybe consider this passage. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season. Does that sound like a reward for obedience? I mean, we've all been kids, right? We received rewards for obedience. We received rewards for doing the things that we were supposed to do. Well, that's what God is doing. I will send you rain in its season. Why? Why will he send us rain in its season? If, if then covenant If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season and the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until planting and you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I will grant peace in land and you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. I will remove wild beasts from the land and a sword will not pass through your country. Oh, okay, so he will reward he will protect, he will prosper us 
So prosper is another context. I don't know if that was listed in, I don't even think it was in Strong's. Maybe it was, I could be wrong. But prosper or multiply, those are the context in which God used blessing. Are we praying for God to bless food, for him to reward food, for him to prosper food? Because there is no context for that in the Bible. Now, there is one context that I came across that may, I am surprised that no one uses this in, in their argument that we should be blessing food. But there is one context in which God says, I will bless your water and your bread. Exodus 23, verse 25. Worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. So what is he saying here when he says, I will bless your food and water? Because they didn't have chemicals. They didn't have anything that they were worrying about in terms of their food and water. Is he saying, I'll make your food and water clean? No, there's no pre precedent for that in scripture. Like your food and water was unclean. You were to separate the clean from the unclean, the holy from the unholy. That's what he was teaching you here. What he's saying here is I will multiply, I will prosper your food and water. There is no precedent for praying for God to bless our food and water. And by that meaning, what is he going to do? Is he going to make it alive? Is he, is he going to take out the chemicals? Is he going to, what is he going to do there? There's no precedent for that. Nor is there a command, but there is a command for us to give thanks and to make sure that we give thanks prior to partaking in our harvest, such as in Leviticus 23 during the Feast of Weeks, when we were to bring the sheaf of the wave offering, have it waved by the priest to be accepted on our behalf, and we were not to partake in any grain until we did that. Why? Because God wanted us to acknowledge him and that he is the one who provides our harvest before we partake partake in it or partook in it. Let's go back to Leviticus 26 verse 4. I will send you rain in its season. The ground will yield its crops and trees their fruit. So again, he's blessing their harvest. How is he blessing it? It's producing. It's multiplying. It's prospering. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until planting and you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. Nothing about cleaning up your food here. I will grant peace in the land and you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. I will remove wild beasts from the land and the sword will not pass through your country. You will pursue your enemies and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase 10,000 and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers and I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. So by the way, if indeed, which this is not the context of the scripture, but if indeed Jesus was blessing the food that he fed the 4,000 with, that he was multiplying, prospering that food. Though the context, if you look at the, at the translation, you will see that he was giving thanks to God. He was blessing God by giving thanks and praise to him. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. Now, do you understand what blessing is? Blessing is reward for obedience. Blessing means that you will be protected, multiplied, prospered, what did he say when he made Adam and Eve? He blessed them and said to multiply. So what are curses? Curses are punishment. A kindergartner, a five-year-old could tell us this. What's a punishment? What's a reward? Why do you get a reward? Why do you get a punishment? What is a blessing? What does a reward look like? What does a curse, what does a punishment look like? But us adults who are so wise, we think we got to scream curses away. We don't recognize, we don't have any kind of basic sense like a child that when a curse is sent, it has been sent by God who is sovereign for punishment, for disobedience. And the way to make that go away is to go and return to him and acknowledge what we've done and then change, which is called repentance. This is basic stuff. 
God does not require us to be so sophisticated in our intellect to understand what he has required. A child could tell us this. So why have we made it so complicated? If blessings are given for obedience, why would we then be blessing our food? Very good, pasta. You did a good job today. No, that's not what we're doing. And if blessing is to multiply or to prosper, for whom is that? Is that for my plate of pasta? Or is that, again, a reward? So when we pray, when we sit down to eat, we bless God. We obey what he has commanded and he prospers us. He protects us. And when we disobey, he punishes us. He curses us. He disciplines and teaches us and causes us to return. When people come on the channel and they try to convince me of like certain conspiracy theories or uh, doctrines such as the most recent one was flat earth or one of the more recent ones was flat earth. The earth is flat. We've been lied to. And I don't care uh, because God hasn't made me care, by the way. I would care if he made me care. If he put that on my heart, then I'd be all about it. But I'd also be able to tell you why we should care. So that was one of my questions is since this is so important to you and you claim to be doing the work of the Lord and you claim that this truth is very important for us to understand, surely the Lord has told you why this is so important. So tell me, what has he told you about why this is important and why I should care? Because as far as I'm concerned, it's just a distraction from actually caring about things that are important, like what does this mean to my covenant? How does this help me to draw closer to God? And the only answer I ever really got that was kind of wasn't satisfactory because truth matters. Okay, well, tell me why. Why does this particular truth matter? You know, like like those are the kind of th- kinds of things that people say like to shut you up, but I don't really shut up. If it doesn't make sense to me, I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to just say, oh, okay. Truth matters. We still haven't answered the question, why does this truth matter? So I'm going to tell you why this matters because I should be worth my salt. Why this matters is because counterfeit religion is very focused on the clean from the unclean being outside of you. Filthy, dirty inside, right? And this is what Jesus talked about when he came here and he was talking to the Pharisees and he said, you're hypocrites, Clean the inside of your cup and then the outside of your cup will be clean. Because they were so focused on a bunch of rituals and rules and do this and do that. But they had no wisdom to understand that what God cares about is what is inside. Inside what you ask, inside your heart, where you're going to be justified. All of this focus, think about this, all of this focus on hand sanitizers and masking up and gloves and goggles and blah, 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 blah. Oh, you got to take this vaccination or your, so that you can be inoculated. Well, God proved thousands of years ago that people living in the same town, the Israelites and the Egyptians, that he could pass over his people despite the fact that they didn't have running water in their hands, to, or, excuse me, in their houses to wash their hands. They didn't have all of this stuff. He passed over his people when he sent plagues. He passed over his people when he took the firstborn of every Egyptian house, household. God is the one who's sovereign over these things. God's people are supposed to know that and not be so externally focused on physical cleanliness or even on chemicals in your food. He has the ability to keep you clean. The word says you're going to swallow poison and it won't affect you. So do you believe that or not? You don't invoke blessing or protection through words. You invoke blessing and protection through what? What does his word say? What does Leviticus 26 say? It says for obedience. You don't hit buzzwords in a prayer and then, oh, you forgot to bless the food. Well, I guess you're just in for it. You're going to get a tummy ache. Bless God, obey God, and he will bless you. Please discern this message with him.